thanks very much. Um, my task until the coffee break is now to sort of give a very top level overview of what we have been thinking about in the context of the life initiative so far. I will not go into any details. There's other talks and maybe some of the posterish contributions that do that. So I'll really be focusing on the on the top level perspective here. Not only providing some what I would call you know great outlooks, but also some of the challenges that we are, we are actually facing. We, we try to summarize the, the vision of the Life Initiative in this short uh, paragraph here, and it may not come as a surprise that we try to develop the scientific context, the technology, and a roadmap for an ambitious mid infrared space mission that allows us to investigate the properties of a large sample of exoplanets, including 30 to 50 orbiting within the habitable zone of their host stars. I will not explain and motivate the 30 to 50, but if you're interested, happy to chat afterwards. It's making sure that the null result is sort of interesting scientifically. In other words, if you don't find anything interesting, this is a big result and not just, you know, that you were unlucky. Overall, it's about the diversity of exoplanets. Uh, I put this specifically for Michael in there as a first bullet, then about the access, the habitability, and then for biosignatures. And if you listen to Bertrand's talk, this is exactly the same order, right? So it's uh, maybe not a coincidence that following this, go from the general, the diversity to the habitable, to the biosignatures. This is maybe the, the, the way we, we should be thinking about this. I tried to uh, summarize some of the different viewpoints from the previous contributions in, 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 this, in this slide here. Because if you think about detecting characterizing rocky worlds, you may want to think about two dimensions at least. There could be several, uh, but at least two that are maybe important, um, in particular important for the discussion in the coming days. One is the reflected light versus this, the thermal emission. And one is what kind of host star do you have? Is it a solar type star or is it an M star? And what I do now is I populate this, this uh, little matrix here with uh, observatories that will contribute to this. And I believe, uh, I actually share the, the somewhat skepticism of, of Dimitri, but in the long run, I would hope that uh, it's going to be the ELTs that are going to give us the reflected light for the M stars, because uh, the, the optical um, space missions are probably not going to do that because of too small apertures, so we will not get any reflected light from E roof or whatever it's going to be called in the long run. This is, this is I believe, ground-based ELT science. But obviously, getting reflected light around solar type stars, this is the territory of, of E roof. And then this leaves for the thermal emission, uh, I believe, uh, emission uh, like, like life. We will get one or two planets uh, from the ground with metas like instruments, but it will be very limited, in particular also in terms of characterization, what we can really learn about these planets, apart from just detecting them. So this is um, I believe very important to keep in mind because sometimes also in discussions it gets very confused when you talk about detecting rocky, you know, potentially habitable exoplanets. And you have to be very careful what you're talking about in order not to confuse, confuse people. Probably most of you have something in mind when you talk or think about an, an, a lifelike interferometer in, in space. I just wanted to put this, this up here that at least we have a, a common first understanding. Hopefully this will evolve over the course of the coming days. So it's going to be a, a nulling interferometer, uh, formation flying, free flying. Um, for collector spacecraft, we have to see. I think this is up for discussion. This is how we currently depict it. Um, I think what is somewhat more clear is the, the baseline separation. So we're going to talk about you know, a few tens to a few hundreds of meters in one dimension and a few tens to maybe 100 meters in, in the other direction. So it's going to be maybe a rectangular shape if it's, if it's for collector spacecraft. And then we have a beam combiner here. Whether this is out of the plane or in the same plane, again, something that we still have to, to figure out. This, is somewhat, uh, this design here, this architecture was somewhat the preferred design at the end of the TPFI and Darwin studies. This is where I believe all the ultimate, um, everything culminated in before these two, two missions got, got canceled, unfortunately. We talk of wavelengths, um, about a wavelength range between 4 and 80.5 uh, uh, micron with a spectral resolution of order 50. All this needs to be reconfirmed. This is based on some retrieval studies we did. And again, I'm happy to talk about some of the details uh, later. Why we choose this wavelength range uh, is, is, I think, nicely motivated here. And again, it was already mentioned, obviously. If you look at the thermal emission of the terrestrial planets in our solar system, uh, Earth, Venus, and Mars here, you see that this range is where all this emission is peaking. And at the same time, you see also this beautiful absorption features that we have. So it's really the combination of making sure you, you capture most of the thermal emission, most of the intrinsic flux, giving you access to the intrinsic temperature uh, of these objects, and at the same time being able to look for, for atmospheric uh, features, some of which are uh, the biomarkers, the biosignatures that were already introduced uh, earlier on. 
I wanted to put in this somewhat boring slide, but I think it's important because it really summarizes nicely what I believe are some of the key advantages of, of doing mid-infrared uh, observations. And again, this is just to remind all of us about these, these, these features. So one is clearly that we can uh, measure the pressure temperature structure of an exoplanet atmosphere directly because you're probing the whole emission going from the surface up uh, through, the, through all of the atmosphere. We have access to multiple absorption bands from major molecules. And also here, this multiple absorption bands turns out to be useful if you have different bands, for instance, of water, different wavelengths ranges. Detecting both at the same time gives you a much stronger handle on the, on the abundances instead of having just one feature. So this is, I think, a big, big advantage as well. So it includes water, CO2, CO, uh, and in principle also uh, collision induced absorption of, of uh, N2 and, and O2. Um, we have a range of atmospheric biosignatures. This was already introduced, the classical ones, uh, but also some more exotic ones. And actually, um, Tiffany, she mentioned the new study from the Schwiedemann group, and we're actually working with them to run them through the live simulator as we're speaking, basically, to, to see how, how well we could do this with, uh, with the lifelike instrument. We measure the effect of temperature directly, and we get an access to the radius, which, as already was mentioned, is quite unique, and very important. Uh, something that may not be so clear, uh, but turns out to be also very important, is that uh, if you don't know if you have a plan to do a search phase, you're much less prone to, you know, to, to have the right uh, orbital position in order to detect it, because you're probably the thermal emission. The phase angle or the phase where you're observing the planet is not as important as for reflected light missions. So I think this is one of the reasons when we do yield calculations, why we believe our completeness, if you have just one go, is larger than for the reflected light missions, because we don't have this this phase, uh, this phase problem. Um, and then, and I'm going to show a slide on this. Actually, in principle, you could start observing to date if you're interested in small tempered exoplanets, because we have detected some around nearby M stars, and they are not accessible to reflected light missions, but a mission like this could go and analyze them already now. So basically, you can have a target list from day one, in depending if, if you're not willing to invest a certain, into a search phase. To put some numbers to this, it's not about the details here, it's just to give us a flavor. These are yield calculations we did well, well, probably more than two years ago already. Um, happy to talk about the details here, what we, went, what we, what we assumed for the instrument. And uh, we, we tried to make a comparison with the reflected light a studies done, uh, done here in, in, in the US. And it's not about you know, who has more planets and who has more what kinds of planets. It's just to give you a flavor that a lifelike mission is of order, you know, provides the same kind of uh, yields uh, for, uh, li like, like the, the Louvre B uh, concept and probably also the E-roof e -roof concept. So we're talking about the same ballpark numbers here, which in principle can already suggest that there might be some great synergies between these, uh, these two missions. In order to motivate life or lifelike mission even further, what, what we did is we, we, we went and, and wanted to understand how much James Webb science uh, will be done, in particular for the, for the smallish planets. And this is a, a figure taken from this very nice review from um, Robin and, and Laura here. Uh, and you see here different kind of uh, types of planets, if you want. This is equilibrium temperature. This is the radius of the planet. This is the empirical separation between uh, gas-dominated planets and, and rock-dominated planets. And you see here different atmospheric compositions that you would expect to be the main, the main features, uh, depending on the, on the equilibrium temperature of these objects. And all of these little dots here, you have Earth and Venus, all of these little dots here are transiting planets that are already or will be observed with James Webb. So they are in the GTO program, they are in the Open Time programs, and they are in the Early Science Release programs. Uh, but this is basically it, right? So all of them are here. It's not going to be more. I think this is hopefully fair to say that most of the planets, there will not be many more discovered from, from TESS or anything else. So this is basically the discovery space if you're interested in rock dominated planets. And what we did here is using our yield simulations, we overplot what the discovery space for life would look like. And again, don't worry too much about how many, how many planets this are, but it's in particular about the parameter space that you're covering. So really covering into uh, this regime here down to Earth and Venus-like planets and significantly expanding the types of plants you could actually analyze in, in great detail. And I think this is a very nice representation of you know, the synergies between what we can expect from James Webb and what we hopefully can do in the future. Another way to look at it, this and this I already mentioned, is um, what about the known planets? And again, this, this blob here, this is insulation the planet receives. This is the radius of the planet. The red blotch here is the same contours as here. Um, 
but now overplotted are known planets within 10 parsec. Basic, mostly from, radio, well, all of them, I believe, from radio velocity searches. And again, you can see that Earth and Venus are here. There are some that have been detected right where the bulk of the life planets should be. Uh, but all of them are around nearby M stars. And again, this is something that uh, our E-Roof mission is not gonna give us. But based on these targets here, you could write down planets that you would like to investigate as of today, where you have already an M Sinai measurement, where you know where it is, where you know when to observe. And I think this is, this is very important. A uh, quick um, shout out to a new paper that Oscar Carrion Gonzalez is uh, hopefully submitting next, or next week or the week after. He has done that to a much greater level of detail and also folding in which of, known, which of the known planets can be detected with an EROOF like mission. So it's life versus known planets plus Habex, Luvar, EROOF versus known planets. So to really start seeing the synergies. And um, this is, I think, a very important uh, point to keep in mind when we talk about the, you know, the long-term strategy and synergies between different kinds of missions and, and going forward. So this is it for the exoplanet science. Uh, we also have in mind a, a huge set of complementary science, at least in general. So you can think of circumstellar disk science, probing the terrestrial planet formation region, dusty tori of AGNs, star formation cluster formation, the innermost regions of dense cores, um, and evolved stars, dust shells. So whenever you have something that is enshrouded in dust or emitting strongly mid infrared uh, wavelength and where you would like to have uh, high sensitivity and high spatial resolution, I think there's a lot to do. Um, and this is why we, we, we put those things also on our menu list for, or menu for, for, for life. However, this brings me directly to the, to the challenges that, that, that uh, I would like to mention on my last slide actually. So, we spend a lot of time on the exoplanet science so far, for good reason, because this is what's driving the, this, this mission idea. But um, all the great other stuff that I was mentioning, we really didn't really look into yet. So we didn't really quantify you know, what life could do for all these different, different things. Um, one reason being that we don't have a, the right simulation tool at this point in time. Uh, another challenge that we're currently facing is we're starting to investigate different beam combination or signal modulation schemes, uh, which is, I think, very important. But then we also have to fold this back into the different science cases, right? And this has not been done yet systematically. So it's great that you investigate different combinations, flavors uh, of, of knowing and so on, but you would like to you know, make sure that you also know what it means for, for the science, and this we haven't done so yet. Uh, we started implementing instrumental noise terms. So far, we have been focusing on uh, photonized limited observations. Whenever you talk about detections, we had a margin to the SNR that we re require for detection to compensate that we don't have a proper noise model yet. So it's not an SNR 5 that we require, but at least 7 for a detection to make sure we have some, some margin for the detection. But uh, Felix is working on, uh, on this part here right now as we speak. But also then we have to make sure that we uh, you know, take this through and, 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 and make sure to understand the impact of the different science cases. And obviously there's a connection between the two because the instrum instrumental noise terms might be different depending on the nulling scheme and what sort of modulation scheme you're, you're, you're using. This is actually very close to my heart because we have been working quite a lot on, uh, as I would call it, uh, individual science cases. You know, it's uh, can we detect this? Can we look for the biosignature pairs? And so on. Uh, but what I'm missing so far is really a little bit um, is science cases that leverage the largest subsamples of the discovery space of life. You know, when we talk about the diversity of atmospheres that Michael was advocating and keeps advocating, what does it really mean? What are the hypotheses that we'd like to test? And there we're lacking some, 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 some things we could really work out and, you know, say how many plants do you need for this? What kind of plants do you need in order to, to make this? So that this, this is not only discovery, but really uh, astrophysics science that you would like to do. And this is something we have to, to work on. And then finally, um, two points. Uh, there was another point that I put down here, but that got lost in the final version of this, of this presentation. One is, of course, the uncertainty in the statistics that we all have to live with. Uh, it's not, the error bars are actually large. And if you make predictions, in particular for the small rocky worlds close to the habitable zone. So this is a challenge that we have to face. Um, but I think everyone has, has, to, has to face this. And the other question is, of course, is there a way to increase the target list prior to launch? So we have some plants that we could start looking at immediately, but it's gonna be the M star planets. It's not gonna be the K or G star planets. So what do we do about this? Are we willing to take the risk? Or how can we make sure we get the target list as complete as possible prior to launch? I think this is one of the standard challenges that we, that we are facing in this grand endeavor 
just in general, not only for life, but, but in general. Um, and the question is also, do we, need, do we need that at all, right? Or are we willing to invest months, if not years, into a search phase prior to some uh, characterization phase that, that may follow? And with this, thank you very much. <laughs>